we live in a world that's constantly searching. Every day on the internet, there are thousands, millions, even billions of searches that are seeking out answers for all kinds of issues, all kinds of problems, all kinds of solutions, all types of things to purchase, everything under the sun that's going on in those types of searches. And we've gotten so accustomed to the fact that if we want to know something, we can pull out our phone and we can type in, what does this mean? Boop, ah, there it is. In fact, yesterday when I was getting my hair cut, uh, the guy that was talking with me and cutting my hair, he couldn't remember what certain words in Chinese were in English, so he had, there, what's that, yeah, yeah. And, and so we talked, you know, partly by him typing in and getting an answer just like that. And we're used to that. We, we think every solution, boom, it's got to be quick, it's got to be fast, because that's what we've grown accustomed to. And you know, there are some times when we're searching out something that the answer does come fast. And we're able to find it real quickly. But sometimes the search takes longer. And, and we have to get engaged in the search more. And I don't want us to get so attached to the way we're doing things right now that we lose the ability to search. Because today, I want us to think about seeking like wise men. You, you see, we, we many times in our Christus, Christmas narratives and Christmas plays and different things, you know, the wise men come to the, to the manger just like the shepherds come to the manger. But if you really know the story, the wise men were never at the manger. Matter of fact, if you come to our house right now, you'll see that the manger scene is over on a table over here, and the wise men are all, all the way across the room on the top of the entertainment center because they're not at the manger scene. And I know that shocks some of you. But when we look at it, it took them longer to get there. The shepherds were told by the angel, go see Jesus, and they got there that night. The wise men were told, go see Jesus. And it took months to arrive. So today I want us to think about how we search. I want us to think about the effort that we put into it. And I want us to look at this story that we find in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So, Follow along with me as I read. It says, Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him gathering together the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And he said, they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you will come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I Two may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, 
and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream, did not return to, to Herod. The Magi left for their own country by another way. The Magi. Who are these? Well, again, we, we're, we're told in our Christmas hymns, we three kings of Orient are bearing gifts, right? Why? Are they kings? No, the Magi are not kings. They are connected to royalty, though, because they are advisors to the royalty, but they also have a priestly role. So in, in their cultural background, they had this priestly role and a royal advisory role. And some people saw them as the kingmakers of, of the time. As a matter of fact, this would not be the, you know, in the Bible we have this arrangement where we see him, them coming and, and recognizing Jesus as king. We see other times in Greco-Roman documents that they went to other places and actually recognized the kings of other places. They were looking. They were, they were always seeking. And, and there, was a, there was a history that we're told by the Roman historians that at this time in history, there was a clear understanding that there was going to be a king that would rise from Judea that would actually rule over the entire world. And think about that. Two different historians point to that fact. So the people are expectant. They're trying to figure this out. And, and the Magi would study old documents. They would study old books. They would study old records. And they would try and put everything together. They would study the stars. And they would try and figure out the scientific relationship. They were, they were scientists. But you need to understand, scientists then didn't separate God and science like today. You know, so, and, and many scientists today, folks, still don't separate God and science. But when we look at it, we understand these are, these are prominent people who are, are looking for a king. And so I want us to think about their search. I want us to look at it just a moment. And I want to think about it in how does it affect the way we need to think about searching. First, I want us to look at <clears throat> the search always requires that we leave some things behind. You know what? Some of us get caught up in our homes and our families and our comfort and our opinions and our traditions that God could reveal something to us and we would never search out the truth. We would never dig through the Word of God to find out what His purpose is for our life. We would never consent to hearing from Him because, honestly, we don't intend to go searching for that truth anyway. And you know what? I'm convinced that if you're not willing to step out and leave your traditions behind, leave your comforts behind, leave your family behind, leave everything else behind, God's not going to reveal some things to you. And he's not going to make that so amazing. These guys, they wanted to see this king. They wanted to understand everything, and they wanted to go after him. And it says, after Jesus was born, what did they do? They came. They arrived from the east. They traveled. They left their home. They left their... You know what? Here, here's what we don't... They made a decision that this was important. And you and I, if we're going to search out what, what God is all about, if we're going to search out who Jesus is and how important that is in our life, we've got to make it a part of our understanding that it's very important for us to seek Him. You see... They would have come from, most likely, the Persian or the Babylonian area. 
They would have been influenced by teachers and leaders historically, such as Daniel. You know, Daniel was called Magi. That's, that was his role. He was a priestly person, but he was also a royal person. And so we, we've got this. And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, it says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. But it itself will endure forever. That had been the prophecy. And these men would have been aware of that prophecy. And they would have been searching throughout their historical times of what does this say? Where does it fit in? What happens? And at this point, they begin and they see the star in the east. You know, there's a lot of people get concerned about that star because they don't, they don't understand that star. They'll try and figure out, you know, what were the constellations like then? What were the meteors like then? What were the comets like then? You know what, folks? It doesn't matter. It's just like people that get stuck on Jonah's fish. The Bible says God prepared the fish. Here, God prepared the star. It doesn't matter if it matches up with anything that we can conjure up in our scientific brains. It's a God thing. We can't even understand how God could be the fire that went before Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. We can't understand that, but that's exactly the type of thing that's happening here. And they were willing. So they saw the star. They put together all that they had been learning. And they knew the search was on. I want you and I to understand when we search for Jesus, everything else needs to be laid, laid aside. A second thing we see is sometimes a search can take a lot of time. As I mentioned a while ago, the, the, the shepherds, they were told, and they, they got there that night. These guys, they weren't that close. As a matter of fact, if, if we're looking at Herod's request, we're looking at the response, we're looking at how he responds later when in, in just the, the verse after this passage, he, he moves on Bethlehem to kill every child male below the age of two. It's estimated by most scholars that at this point in Jesus' life, he's somewhere between 13 months old and, and 20 months old, somewhere in that time frame. So he's, he's not a little baby in a in a manger scene. He's now a, a child. He's probably walking around. And it took them a great amount of time to get there. If they're from that Medo-Persian area, if they're from that Babylonian area, the normal trade route would have taken them about 800 miles, about 1,300 kilometers. And, and that's not a quick trip. And if they would have done the normal type of travel and they would have walked through that process, it would have taken them almost 50 days to have made that journey one way. So when I say, you know, they, they had to leave their family, what would you be like if, if you just said, oh, I, I've got an idea. Or you go tell your wife, I'm going to go follow a star. Well, where are you going? I don't know. Wherever that star leads me, I'm going to go. How long are you going to be gone? I don't know. Because I don't know where the star is leading. <laughs> now, some of you wives would go, go, hon, I'll pack your bag. <laughs> but, you know, I want you to understand. It took them 50 days one way. They wouldn't have seen their family for more than 100 days. A third of a year. It took them time. I also understand sometimes our searches aren't quick. 
You want to know the truth of God. And I have so many people, a lot of times they'll say, I, I want to know God's truth. I want to know God's direction. I want to know, and they, and they spend five minutes in God's word and they don't understand it and they close the book. Listen, you got to dig in there. You got to take time. You got to spend time with God's word. Discover what it says and seek out the truth about Christ. The third thing I want us to see is sometimes we seem to get sidetracked. Now, I put the word seem here because if, if we look at the passage, it says they arrived in Jerusalem. And we know that's not where Jesus was born. Now, now, some people may say, and, and, and I've had times in my life, I believe, I go, well, you know what? They probably went there because the star was over Israel, and the most likely place for a king to be born is in the capital. So they go to the capital, and they, but you know what? They went where the star led them. Now, they may have made some assumptions, just like we make assumptions sometimes and get things wrong. We hear God saying, go do something, and we, 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 we want to just charge right ahead. And he may be saying, let's go about it at this angle. You know, let's, let's go a roundabout way to get there. You think about it, sometimes God does that. The children of Israel could have gotten to the promised land in four days. But the route that God took them if they would have remained faithful, would have taken several months. But we know that their faithlessness led to 40 years. And sometimes we see where God wants to lead us. Don't assume just because I know where God's leading that I know how he wants me to get there. Okay? So I need to, I need to understand that when I'm going through things... God's got a direction. Now, in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 25 and through 27, it says, Let your eyes look directly ahead, and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil. You see... Here's what I want you to understand. If you're searching for Jesus, follow his direction. Because personally, I don't think them arriving in Jerusalem was a wrong destination for them at that moment. I think God wanted Herod to know he had arrived. And he knew that Herod wouldn't know it any other way. And also, I think God wanted to challenge the religious leaders of the day to see where they're going to stand. And so we, we have many times in our life that we arrive at a destination that we think is sidetracked. Why am I here? You're here to walk faithfully with God. And if you're walking faithfully with God, He's going to lead you. It may not be a straight path. That may not be the best way for you to grow. That may not be the best way for you to develop your faith. That may not be the best answer for those who are walking with you. It may not be what you need as much as those that are coming with you need. You know, so understand, if you're following God's lead, there's never a sidetrack. You may be somewhere that you don't understand, but trust God's lead. The fourth thing I want us to see is the search is often opposed. Now, somebody would say, well, well, King Herod definitely didn't oppose the search. He wanted the search to go on, and he wanted the baby to be found. And that, but you know what? 
actually that is part of the opposition because the fact is what he's wanting is he's wanting them to succeed in their search so he can destroy what their hope is. And I want you to understand there are some people that want you to succeed so that they can cut the rug out or pull the rug out from under you later. They want you to succeed so they can destroy your hope. Herod. Goodness, who was he? Herod the Great. That's what he was known as of this time. Herod the Great was a half Jew, half Idumean, who was put in as the client leader the client king, that meant he wasn't truly king. Rome was the government. In other words, he was a puppet king under Rome over Jerusalem and Judea. So everything he did had to be approved by them. He was noted as an amazingly great builder. He built aqueducts that were very important, and everybody praised him for that. He provided all kinds of opportunities. He built a huge addition to the temple. He, he did some amazing projects. He actually, the harbor, uh, one of the harbors that Israel uses still to this day was built by Herod. It was dug out and, and framed by him. He was indeed a great builder, but he was also one who overtaxed multiple and he also was one who loved power and as he loved power he was fearful of anything and anyone that could threaten his power as a matter of fact during the the administration of Herod over 300 of the Sanhedrin which was the ruling court of the Jews were executed so you think about that. You disagree with me, you have a different opinion, fine, boom, I'll take your life. He was so threatened by his people around him. Matter of fact, he had multiple wives, and he had multiple sons, and he had most of them killed. If you as the mother came up to him and said, do you think you could begin to groom my son to be the next ruler? <laughs> wow so no wonder he had all the boy babies killed because he was just trying to make sure hey look what what a terrifying thing that had happened in his life when these guys who are known as the kingmakers come to his court, win his audience, and begin to say, we've come to see the king of the Jews. Now think about that. Kings aren't born. Princes are born. But they've come to see the king. And they've come to see the king of the Jews. What kind of terror did that propped in his mind he knew the prophecies he knew what was going on he knew that a ruler would be rising from Judea he knew that a ruler would come that would establish a worldwide kingdom he understood those things and he saw it as an absolute threat so sure you go ahead you be successful in your search because I'm going to destroy whatever you find Then another type of opposition is just that attitude of indifference. I mean, just think about it. He calls together the chief priest and he calls together the scribes, and what happens? Where is Jesus, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? Oh, easy, Bethlehem. Micah 5 2. And they quote it. But I want you to watch something. They quote it. But they don't go to Bethlehem. They don't walk five miles to see this wondrous thing that has happened. They could care less. And I want you to know there are a lot of religious people that you will connect with that in your search for Jesus Christ, in your search for significance, in your search for purpose, will kind of blow it off as if, no big deal, just enjoy your life. 
Just continue to do what you're going to do. In, tr in reality, they're opposing everything God stands for. Because God wants you to search him out and see him as important. They had said when, when I asked Micah 5, 2, but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Doesn't that paint a picture of John chapter 1, the first few verses? In the beginning was God, or in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God from long ago. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 5 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. These chief priests and scribes understood that. But it was not important for them to go search. These other guys had already made 795 miles of the 800 mile trip. How disappointed could you be when you get to that point in your journey and somebody says, oh, this is no big deal. Don't be discouraged by the opposition. Don't be deceived by the opposition. Stay focused on the search. As you can find many people who will lead you astray. It's like I have couples sometimes that they'll, they'll say, uh, you know, we want, we want help to know how to grow in our marriage. Then I'll tell you one thing to do. Don't go to some people that are struggling and ready for a divorce. As you can find plenty of reasons to divorce anybody. You really can. Every marriage can find those reasons. But if you focus on the reasons why not to, then God will show you that also. Search the right places. The, the fifth thing I want us to see is that God will help direct our search. Now notice, they went to the religious leaders. They went to the king. They went to the places that they assumed that the star was pointing. And was going a different place. Brought them there to begin with. Now, they're, they're serious about their search. They're like, we want to know more. See, they're now are scripturally informed even more about their search. Where did they find the direction? One, from scripture. That's where you're going to find your direction. That's where God's going to speak to you. But also, as they walked out, that star was there. Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 after hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went before, on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And they saw the star. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Now, let me, let me tell you, I don't believe this was a normal star. I, I've been, I mean, I know in Hong Kong most of us have never seen stars. You know, to be frankly honest, you know, we look up the, it's just light. You have to get out from the city lights to be able to see the stars. I was raised in the country. There were 300 people in our town. There were only 25,000 people in our whole county. 
Our county was bigger than Hong Kong as far as land-wise. So you think about it. One apartment complex in the whole place, take care of it. When you look at the stars, you can say, okay, yeah, there's the North Star. There's the Big Dipper. Here's where it's pointing. You know, we, we know how to get to north. But you know what? I have never in my life seen a star point out a specific place. But they did. That star directed them. And I want you to understand something. When you're looking for God, you're looking for answers, you're looking for His lead, you're looking for His direction, get ready for the fact that He's going to lead you. Now remember, His Word is going to be a major part of that. But in Jeremiah 29, verse 13, you know, we usually do the verse or two before that, you know, number 11, I know, and then He goes, You will seek me. And you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. Wow. God says the search is not simple. It takes me getting rid of some of my old baggage. It takes me committing my time. It takes me overcoming opposition. It takes me getting into the Word and finding out some answers. But the last thing I want us to see is the search is worth it. It is always good when we find the Lord. It is always amazing. I mean, they come to the house and they see Jesus. He's there. Can you imagine what goes on? Their response wasn't, you know, Mary, tell me about the birth experience. Tell me about how, uh, tell me about he, what he did at age three. Tell me what he, I mean, age three months. Tell me what he did at age six months. Tell me what his first, th no, they didn't ask all those questions. When they got there, their focus wasn't Mary. Their focus wasn't Joseph. Their focus wasn't anything else. It was Jesus. They knew they had found the king. And they bowed and they worshiped before this king. And they gave themselves. You know, some people will say, well, oh, these are just pagan people. They I don't believe these are pagan guys in the sense of what... I think they're people who are searching for a true, true God. Just like they're... You know what? One of the things that stunned me this... Uh, we, I've been teaching evangelism at the seminary this semester. And one of the, uh, one of the resources we were using, uh, one of the things it talked about is that people who are non-Christians but are very religious, 67% of those people who are sold out completely to other religious groups are still looking for something that will give them peace. I believe that's what the Magi were. People who are looking for true peace, and true peace can f be found in Jesus. And as they come and they worship Him, they bring him gold, they bring him frankincense, they bring him myrrh. And that's where most people get the we three kings. They get it from the gifts. We don't know. There could have been 25 guys there. They wouldn't have traveled in a small group. But it could have been 25 magi. Or it could have been two that brought three gifts. We don't know. And that's totally unimportant. The fact that they came... And the fact that they ultimately worshipped. And they fell down. They brought gold, a gift suitable for a king, definitely. They brought frankincense, which was often a gift to royalty. And it's amazing, you know, we think about frankincense. Do you realize that frankincense gives off its best fragrance when it is crushed? It has to be crushed. What about Jesus? Do you realize Jesus gave his life for you and me? He was crushed for my sins and your sins. He was crushed for my shame and your shame. He was crushed for my fear and your fear. He was crushed for my indifference to him. Myrrh. 
not usually a gift for the king's birth. Somewhere along the way, a king would get myrrh. But one of the things we learned from the rabbis is that myrrh was considered and associated with sacrificial death. Even the gift points to the cross. I want you and I to understand Jesus is worth searching for. Now let me tell you this. If you're searching for Jesus at the same time you're searching for some other person or another religious idea or another philosophy that will help you or another thing that will give you peace, I can tell you what, God already knows your search needs to be refined. That's why I always tell people, I say, you know what, ask God to direct your search. Ask God to give you direction. Ask God to point out the ways to go. Ask God to put people in your life that will point you in the right direction. Matter of fact, I've, I've been praying that for one of my friends, and it was interesting. This week, he sent me a speaker that he had listened to this last week that was related to his business that was a Christian man that shared the gospel. Amazing. Because he works in a place he would never hear the gospel. You know what? God's pointing out the way. In Psalm 70, verse 4, it says, Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. And let those who love your salvation say continually, let God be magnified. When you find Jesus, fall before him and worship. How's your search? Some of you here this morning haven't begun a search yet. You're just here because a friend invited you. I want you to understand Jesus died for you. He gave his life so that you and I could have a personal relationship with him. He's a personal God, a loving God who desires to walk with you, who desires to intermingle into your life every day to give you guidance and leadership. As a believer, you may have begun your search and found Jesus and at that point found, okay, I'm satisfied. My, my end result is changed. I'm no longer going to hell, but I will be with God in heaven. And then we somehow feel this idea that it's up to us to make it between here and heaven. God didn't say that. God wants to be with you every day. Search Him out. Search His Word out. Feel His comfort. Feel His direction. And let Him move in your life. So this morning, we're going to sing our hymn of invitation. And when we do, would you come and just say, Jesus, I want you in my life. I want to find you and worship you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for your guidance in our life. Thank you for just the privilege of knowing that when we truly do search for you, we will find. In Jesus' name.